does God influence your lawmaking? Oh, absolutely. And uh, I think, uh, in fact, there's no doubt about it. it. That was one of the primary reasons I came down here is uh, I believe that there are certain biblical principles that have, that the nation was founded upon and that have made us the greatest country in the world. And I think that uh, to a great degree they're under attack. And so uh, I came down here to protect those principles and, you know, kind of defend them and, uh, and uh, see if we could move them back to where they were, and uh, so it, it, uh, it definitely affects uh, my position on a lot of the bills that come before us. Now, there's some that, that there are certainly gray areas that I'd say good people could disagree on, uh, but uh, there, there are others that are absolutely bedrock. Is there any, you mentioned issues, is there any issue or position you've taken on a particular issue that stands out where you've turned to your faith for the answer? Well, I, I, I like, for instance, when it came to the sanctity of human life, it was one of those things where uh, I, I remember going back in the 70s when it first occurred, uh, the Roe versus Wade, and what it boiled down to was I uh, really, uh, the more I looked into it, uh, quite frankly, the more pro-life I became. Before that time, I was really because I'd never really thought of it, uh, I was really ambivalent. But the more I looked into it, the more I realized that uh, and, and saw that uh, God had created each and every one of us for a purpose in life, that that began at the point of conception, and that uh, human life is absolutely sacred, and uh, therefore we have a responsibility to protect that. And I think that uh, as I've seen uh, historically, th there are two worldviews when it comes to the, the value of human life. There's the worldview that says that uh, human life is absolutely valuable because we're created in the image of God. That's a biblical worldview. On the other hand, there's the, the worldview that says, well, uh, some human life, there are relative value of human life. Uh, and whenever you have a society that accepts the relative value of human life, it may start off in one area, but it will progress to others. Uh, in fact, uh, if you go back and uh, look at, uh, there was a, uh, 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 I think it was, his name was Leo Alexander, who, who uh, was on the Nuremberg Tribunals, and he was there not to figure out uh, what happened, but why it happened. How did, was it a nation as civilized as Germany ever ended up doing a lot of the things they did? And, and, and what he said was that, uh, that it began with a very subtle shift in the German medical community that there was such a thing as a life not worthy to be lived. And he said that what they saw was over a period of time it progressed more and more to, it started off with uh, like uh, the non-rehabilitatively sick and it began progressing to uh, a wider and wider spectrum of people. And he said, but it's important to realize that from the very beginning, it was the attitude, that subtle shift, that there was such a thing as a life not worthy to be lived. And uh, uh, so, and, and the problem is, is that once you've accepted the relative value of human life, okay, then you know, it, it, it can go into a lot of areas. I think that, uh, uh, you know, it, it becomes uh, that some human life is valuable. Like, for instance, when it comes to the unborn child, it says, you know, if you want the child, the child's valuable. Or, or that human life is valuable. Well, on the other hand, if you don't want the child, that child has all the value of a used Kleenex. And so that's uh, clearly affected my... Uh, viewpoint on uh, uh, on the sanctity of life, but it, it, it not only is it is it there, but it is goes all the way to the end of life as well. For instance, one of the things that uh, uh, we've dealt with in the past is this idea of, like right now in Texas, we have the ability to, uh, not we, <laughs> uh, 
uh, a doctor or hospital would have the ability to put a do not resuscitate orders in your records without your knowledge or permission. And of course that was one of the big fights over SB 404 was that basically, uh, uh, I, th I think that was a bill number. It was the last session with the big fight over a Senate bill uh, that uh, basically said, well, we're going to put a, we can put a DNR in your records, but then we're going to tell you. Uh, and we, or we would make a good faith effort to tell you. And I said, yeah, when are you going to do that? And, uh, but in my opinion, they should never put a DNR in your records with that first you giving your permission. You need to sign off on it. It's not a deal where they ask you verbally. You need to sign a written form stating it. Or you're, uh, obviously if you're in a, uh, a state that w where they can't get your permission, then it needs to be your next of kin that have been given that permission. As I mentioned, we hear God mentioned on, on the house floor. Obviously, we're talking about belief, and people define God differently and maybe their beliefs. What do you say to somebody who reaches a different conclusion than you do based on their God? Well, I, you know, obviously, uh, you know, uh, we have a responsibility to... Uh, be very uh, loving of people, regardless of their perspective. And, uh, but, uh, basically, uh, I, I've looked at, okay, from a, a biblical perspective, it, it, uh, I think that when you start analyzing Christianity, it, it sets its, itself apart from every other worldview. And first and foremost, because uh, uh, Christianity was the only one that it, the entire basis of Christianity is based on a single event in history, and that is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Uh, that is a historical event. If, if it didn't happen, then our faith is in vain. Uh, and uh, whereas every other uh, religious philosophy is based on uh, a, a philosophy, not, not occurrences in history. And uh, so uh, uh, I believe that because of that, Christianity has more validity. But the other thing is, is that uh, if you look at the very foundation of this country, our, our, our country was founded on a biblical worldview, a Judeo-Christian worldview. And uh, that's why you will see numerous founding fathers who said words of the nature that says, uh, our nation was based upon a, uh, a religious and moral people, and their idea of religion was Christianity. And uh, the, the main thing they sought to do was make sure that we did not have a church of the United States. In other words, they, they had seen what had happened in Europe when you have the church and the state get together as far as... Uh, uh, you know, trying to rule things, and what they saw was uh, that one church would try and push all the other churches out. And so, while on the other hand, they believed in uh, uh, freedom of religion, the, the, the premise of, of uh, or in basis of America was based on a, a Judeo-Christian worldview. And that's why when you see in the Declaration of Independence, we're endowed by our Creator with certain unalienable rights, and among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And then if you look at uh, such documents as the, uh, uh, the Northwest Ordinance, Northwest, and that was the document that said, in order to become a state, this is what the process you have to go through. And, and the, the basic thing they said was, Religion, morality, and knowledge being the basis for a free and happy people, public schools shall always teach. Uh, and uh, so, uh, you know, in fact, if you go through the first uh, 150 years of our country, uh, you know, we began school days with a prayer. Uh, we had... Uh, 
uh, you know, Bible study in, in, in uh, schools and that kind of thing. So. so you mentioned, though, I mean, it's important to separate church and state, but you, you, you seem kind of, um, you know, looking back to the good old days when we did start the school day with prayer. But well, see, the, the, the fundamental difference is, is this. You do need to tr uh, separate church and state, not religious practices. Therein is the difference. It, uh, it's just like we start off our, you know, con uh, our session every day with a prayer. And uh, that is a practice that is not, uh, there's not a church that's basically coming in like it's not the Baptist church, not the Catholic church, not the Methodist church or anything else like that, coming in and saying, uh, you know, th this is the way we're starting things off. Mm -hmm. Talking about 4105, the merits of that, mm -hmm. what would that bill have done had we had a discussion last night about it? I, I basically, uh, it, it would have made it uh, uh, easier for us to defend the Texas Constitution uh, against the encroachment of the Supreme Court decisions. So being that same We're not going to fund any other type of uh, uh, marriage licenses. Yeah, I mean, same-sex marriage, I know <coughs> couples and, and everybody, that, it, that uh, segment of our population was definitely watching it, maybe likening it to what we saw in Indiana that's gotten a lot of attention. Well, I think the, the main difference there between Indiana and, and this is that, uh, and see, we had already done what Indiana did. We did that some time ago. But uh, I, th I think that there, somehow people had gotten the idea that that, uh, that would make it where people would, like, would refuse to serve people at a lunch counter because they, they thought they might be gay or something like that. No, it's, it's only having to do with, are you going to be involved in a religious practice, marriage, uh, without, uh, when it's uh, two men or two women? And so uh, uh, I think there was a lot of uh, attempts to misconstrue what this was about. Uh, in, in like in Indiana and things like that. And I think then there was a, basically they had to try and, okay, well, lo, well let's make sure the law is clear that, uh, that you're not going to do that, where in essence, I don't think it's ever been done, where, uh, you know, someone refused to serve lunch or uh, do the cleaning for or whatever, uh, someone just because they were gay. Would that be an instance where, you know, you talk about religious values, and I mean, love is a foundation of, of Christianity. Um, and, and those on the other side would argue that, regardless of gender, the love and commitment is there. Yeah, it, it, here's the thing. I think that, uh, first of all, uh, we need to love people, but that doesn't mean loving what they do. And uh, uh, I think here's, I, I think the main thing here it is in a nutshell that once you start saying redefining marriage based on whether it's just based on, well, they love each other or something like that, once you start doing that, you open up the gate for everything. I mean, why not one man and five women or one woman and five men or why not, uh, uh, you know, uh, lowering the age where it's a 30-year-old man and a 12-year-old boy? Uh, uh, you know, I, I mean then there is no limit. And, uh, but fundamentally what it boils down to is it's, it's an attack on the family. And what you see is uh, the, the family's already been under attack. If you go back to the, the 60s, uh, the out-of-birth weight uh, uh, was by uh, out-of-marriage birth rate was about 5%. Didn't matter, you know, where you came from. Whereas today, it's, you know, like 40%. And I think uh, part of that has been driven by bad government policy. But the other thing is, is that uh, I, I think, again, it's a, it's a degradation of marriage. I think that uh, the, a lot of the uh, no-fault divorce laws, uh, marriage is the only contract you can make where one person violates the contract, there's no consequences. A any other contract you'd sign, there's going to be 
you know, consequences. You, you just can't willy-nilly just wake up one day and say, you know what, I don't think I'm going to abide by my contract. Can you imagine that uh, when you signed a contract to buy your car? You know what, I, I know I signed the deal that I'd pay them $350 a month. I, you know, I decided I don't want to do that anymore. So. Well, anything else to add that I didn't hit on? We touched on a lot as far as, you know, faith and lawmaking with the same-sex marriage, end of life, beginning of life. Um, anything else to hit on? Yeah, I think, it, quite frankly, I think it has a lot to do with our attitudes uh, about uh, the, the government taking money from one group to give to another, okay? Uh, the... the uh, uh, the whole, in fact, I don't know if you remember, our founding fathers, uh, not our founding fathers as far as the ones that were Declaration of Independence and that kind of thing, and the, and the ones that subsequently signed the Constitution, but prior to that, we had uh, people who came here and said, well, okay, we're going to try, uh, we're going to all work together and we're going to share the fruits of our labor, you know, with one another. And you know, doesn't matter what you produce, you're going to get equal share of uh, the fruits. And after they have, a good percentage of them starved to death, then they said, you know, I don't think that works. And so uh, they, ba they basically went back to Scripture and said, you know what? Uh, scripture says if, if a man doesn't work, neither let him eat. And what it boils down to is, is that... Uh, the, they also saw that uh, out of Scripture is the attitude that uh, uh, of uh, thou shalt not covet, thou shalt not steal. That's the whole, the whole idea of there is, first of all, uh, a basis for understanding that we have the right to property. Uh, and the other thing is that, uh, uh, that basically what we ought to be doing is uh, first of all, yes, if I do very well, based on Scripture, my responsibility is to help the poor. But nowhere in Scripture will you find that it says, take from your brother to give to another. What it says is, you leave the corners of your fields. You give. And so our responsibility is as individuals to give. In fact, one of the things you'll find is, uh, and they've found it in a lot of surveys, where conservatives invariably give more, more of their own money to charity uh, than, than, than liberals do. And it's because I think somehow uh, a lot of liberals have gotten the idea that, you know, it's the responsibility of government to help the poor. And it says, no. Uh, it's responsibility of individuals, as you've been blessed, uh, to, to help the poor. And so, um, uh, in, in fact, uh, I, I think we'd, we'd be a lot better off if we started returning back to those principles as opposed to helping, uh, having the government do things.